13, uh, and we're meeting today with Technical Remediation Advisory Committee. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge that the land on which we live has been here from time immemorial, and that Indigenous people have lived here from time immemorial. I thank the Chinoxan, also called the Attawanaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee people who have lived here and cared for this land, and who continue to share and steward this land with us. May we together learn to care for each other, our flora and fauna, and the land that sustains us. Before we get underway, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? No. Okay. Seeing none, um, we do have minutes from our previous meeting. Are there any concerns with those minutes? Uh, can we get a mover for approval of those minutes? Uh, we'll do Linda and Susan all in favor. And that's carried, thank you. Uh, we have no delegations today. We have a couple of presentations. So we're gonna start uh, with the electronic dashboard. So it's the Engage Waterloo platform discussion. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ray to walk us through. Thank you for having me here. I'm just going to share my screen. So as a part of the um, engagement process, when we reviewed the terms of reference, one of the items that came up was to have an electronic dashboard where you could house some of your information and kind of pull it out of being buried within our municipal website. So what we have done is uh, we are a partner on Engage WR. Um, we specifically have our own Woolwich Hub, uh, which I'm showing you here, um, that contains three sections. Um, so there's planning applications and projects. There are infrastructure projects. And then we have community-based projects down at the bottom. Within the community-based projects, that's where we're going to house um, the page for track. Um, I was just kind of showing you that to give you a visual of, of where it kind of will be on the page. This currently is a draft page. So this is not live as of yet. What I have done is taken a bit of information from your terms of reference, as well as some information on um, the municipal website and created this. So right now I've done a little bit of a preamble um, as to what the page is. We have linked specifically to your new track terms of reference, as well as the procedural bylaw. We've also included um, a link to, back to the council and committee calendar where all of your minutes and um, agendas, are, agendas are housed. With this site, we have the ability to add different widgets. And one of them, which you will see once the page is live is for people to subscribe to the page. Um, in subscribing to the page, anytime new information is posted or you're looking to do any sort of engagements on this, we can push out a newsletter to everybody that has signed up for the page and give them some information on whether it's a survey or a poll or, or information that you're looking for. One of the other things that I've added that is a work in progress um, is a timeline of events. Um, we're going through some information and one thing Stacy will probably do um, moving forward is work with the committee on what items you actually want on that timeline um, I just kind of hit some of the larger ones that, that I had just to give you a visual of um, some of the capabilities of it. You do have the ability for news feed items. And what I've done with your news feed is give the information for um, registering to participate in these meetings. Uh, news feed items can be used for a bunch of different things. Um, you also have your resources where your correspondence and all of your reports um, are housed. Again, this is just the information that I pulled off the website. One of the other things that um, we've added is a link to, uh, Stacey, what is it? Laurier. Yeah, to Laurier's. Um, so we can add multiple links there. So if you choose to link back to Lancy's site where they have information housed, you can also do that here that sends it back and forth between, same as links as if they so choose, can link to this specific track page as well uh, to 
bring people here if they're looking for information. Um, I am going to show you the back end. Just need to change my screen so I can see it. <clears throat> In showing you the back end, what I'm going to be able to do is kind of show you a little bit of the capabilities that we have within the program. specifically with surveys and polls. So this is the I can't see it. This is the back end of um, essentially our this page's hub. So one of the things that we have the ability to is add um, we can add life cycles, we can add videos, um, we can do related projects. If you are looking to do any sort of engagement, um, we do have the ability to do, have, we have multiple tools. So we can do forums if you're looking to have interaction with the public where they can comment. Um, you can ask questions that are specific to certain documents if you want feedback on. And a lot of these functions are, um, they can be anonymous and they can come back to a single person. So it's not necessarily a public forum, but if you're looking for engagement or feedback, um, we can set up uh, different things that way. Same as surveys and polls, it all comes in through the back end. It does give the user um, the ability to either be a registered participant on Engage or um, they can anonymous, anonymously submit um, stuff too. That's all in the functionality of how you set up your stuff. So that is essentially Engage WR very quickly. Some of the backend stuff you guys won't really see because it'll be on Stacy. but some of the things that you're looking to do, uh, we can potentially set that up for you as well for your engagement of it. Great. Any Great. questions? Great. Questions, right? That's good. Looks good, yeah. So the next steps going forward is I'm going to do some training with Stacy, and then she'll work with you guys for some of those timelines. But as soon as you're ready, that page can can go live. As far as next steps, are you requiring anything as far as content from the committee? Um, we've spoken with Tiffany and Stacy on just those timeline items, but we can pretty well go live with what we have, and then as um, they kind of work through what you main points you want to hit maybe on that timeline um that's just a quick ch change in the back end and it's live as soon as it is. um you may not know the answer to this question but with engage water the region is there any size restrictions on the files that are able to be uploaded to them i know that's been a concern in the past um there is i think it's around 100 megs um so we currently are right now with um engage wr Jointly within all of the region, within the region, so the region, the cities and the townships, we are going through an RFP process to either go to a different platform than Granicus, which is what Engage WR is housed on. Um, and one of the requirements of that RFP is the ability to do up to 250 megabytes um, on a document. Uh, because there are some projects out there that are, do have very large so that one of our main items is to be able to do large documents okay. yeah and i guess the other question is you mentioned the laurier um library um, yeah. is that electronic like are people able to link to that electronically to pull some of those documents or is yeah so on that front page there's a link and it takes them right to it that they can then um pull information from it Perfect. And I've set it up, everything I've set up on the page is it opens new windows. So you never pull away from that main engage page. They can always go back and forth. So. Right. Tiffany? Sorry, I, I'm, I'm used to where my hand can go up on Teams, but I don't know where it is on, on Zoom. <laughs> Um, I just want to uh, reach out to uh, Susan and Sebastian in particular, and, and also uh, uh, Eric, 
in terms of uh, engaging them in the process of identifying the key highlights in the timeline. Uh, they've been involved far far longer than I have, and um, and would would recognize the key sort of milestones through the process from '89 on. So I just want to make sure that that's on the radar as well. Any other comments or questions for Ray? Discussion. Thank you very much for coming in and giving us that presentation, Ray. It's looking very promising. You're welcome. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. All right, for our next presentation, we do have um, some students from Conestoga College that are gonna present to us um, some work that they had done. And in full transparency, um, what initiated this was you know, when I had come on to Tag and Rack initially, um, I felt somewhat ill-equipped to, um, you know, meet some of these questions that I felt are important to answer. So. You know, when it comes to things like um, pump and treat becoming acetonic for things like NDMA, I think what I wanted to know is, well, what else can be done? Um, so I approached Dr. Klee, who's a colleague at Conestoga College, um, and I just kind of expressed to him some of the concerns that I had regarding this. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Klee, if I can just turn it over to you and maybe you can um, introduce yourself, the program, and the students. Uh, yeah, certainly. I, I'm sorry, I'm not used to being referred to as Dr. Klee, so I just had Ulysses up on my name. Um, yeah, so as Nathan mentioned, I'm a professor as well at Conestoga College. I work in the Environmental Public Health Program, um, and every year we have a research um, course that the students take, it's usually in their final year. Well, actually it is always in their final year. And um, so Nadia and um, and Sadie um, did a project that uh, reviewed the um, different types of remediation or treatment options that might be available um, specifically for NDMA. Um, so, I will turn it over to them and, and they can walk you through their their poster. Thanks, Ulysses. Nice to see you. Good to see you as well. <laughs> so I'm Nadia and Sadie's here as well. We did our uh, research on removal of MDMA uh, in groundwater or aquifers. Um, so we had to do part of our research component. We had to do a poster. So this is our poster. This is all of our main kind of points that we're going to talk about today. Um, and then, yeah, we'll get started for the presentation. As Nadia said, I'm Sadie. Um, our research title is Advancements in NDMA Remediation Investigation Strategies for Meeting Ontario Drinking Water Standards in the Elmira Aquifer Removal in Groundwater. Advancements in NDMA. Sorry, next slide. As Nadia discussed, here is our poster we created. We will be reviewing our research question, significance of research, results, limitations, and significant findings.
Our research we are conducting will aim to answer what are the current practices that reduce the concentrations of NDMA in Elmira water aquifer and what are the new remediation practices are available to meet the Ontario standards for drinking. The significance of our research is focusing on NDMA. NDMA stands for N-nitroside dimethylmaline. It is a chemical that is typically created by industries that produce synthetic rubbers, lubricants, and plastics, also produced by natural processes. It is slightly difficult to detect in the environment and in our drinking water systems because the chemical is a yellow liquid substance that has no recognizable odor. Chlorinated benzene was also a concern of interest as this poses a health issue as well. However, our main focus is on NDMA in the Elmira aquifer. NDMA is a semi-violet organic compound known for its potential adverse effects on humans and the environment. Chronic exposure to this chemical can increase the risk of cancer in humans and disrupt the ecosystems. NDMA was leached into Elmira's aquifer from the surrounding industrial sites over 30 years ago. In this case, this caused a significant concern for the people living in the community and there was an urgent need for MDNA mitigation strategies to remove the MDNA from the aquifer. Currently, Waterloo Municipality is transporting portable water to Elmira for the community. To this day, it still remains a prominent issue as MDNA is still remaining in the aquifer and the community is unable to use the water safely. Methodology, we researched the web through reliable search engines. We use the terms that apply to a research question and filtered through a CASPER tool. We use the CASPER tool, which is an effective tool to ensure that articles were used, we, they were appropriate and fit our research question. We got the chance to tour with Lanix to see their current remediation practices for both wastewater and groundwater, just to get a grasp on what their practices are for removing the MDNA and how they plan on making the environment safe. Nadia is going now to discuss the remediation practices. So in, in our research, we we discovered that there was a lot of remediation practices that we could be using, um, but we found that we narrowed it down to five. Um, so the first one that we researched was reverse osmosis. We found that this was effective in removing MDMA as it uses a semi-permeable membrane to purify the water by applying pressure to with the contaminated water to force it through a membrane. The MDMA contaminate would be physically trapped and prevent it from passing through to the other side of the membrane filter, which can produce clean water. We also found bioremediation utilizing uh, propane oxidizing bacteria this approach involves enzymatically breaking down the MDMA into simpler compounds. Um, this enzyma enzymatic reaction involves oxidization of MDMA leading to less harmful substances. Uh, it can be completed two ways. So it'd be an in-su treatment or an ex-su. So in-su would um, involve directly injecting the propane and oxygen uh, into the contaminated groundwater or aquifer and using aromatic conditions, which increases the growth of propane, oxidizing bacteria, and would degrade the NDMA. The XU would uh, be removing the groundwater from the contaminated sites and pumping it into bioreactors and having the same process of the propane oxidizing bacteria. But then it would be, the treated water would then be returned back into the aquifer or discharged back into the environment. The third we found was granulated activated carbon. Um, this method involves passing contaminated groundwater through a bed of uh, granulated activated carbon, similar to a large Brita filter where the MDMA molecules adhere to the carbon surface, and this is effective in reducing NDMA in, in groundwater. Our fourth, we found ion exchange. This involves by passing contaminated groundwater through a synthetic bed of resins, both anion and cation exchange process. This can remove NDMA by up to 43 to about 83%. 
The anon, anon, anon exchange, exchange involves the passing of MDMA contaminated water through a bed of synthetic resin containing positively charged functional group and exchanging it for negative charged ions. The cation exchange is the exchange um, similar, but the positive charge island ions are more positive charge islands. Ions are exchanged rather than the negative. The last one we found was uh, UV. So the process of UV light is to degrade the MDMA by breaking the NN bonds in the MDMA. This is highly found to be highly effective in removing MDMA from the groundwaters. However, sometimes the high energy consumption and maintenance requirement, it can probably have higher costs. Um, but it was also found to be very effective in removing MDMA. Uh, we found that these strategies were showing promise, but there are limitations. Um, finding the articles focused solely on the individual remedian, remediation processes uh, for remo removing MDMA from the water, other than UV um, radiation, or sorry, UV light, uh, presented a challenge for us. Additionally, the articles also presented effective of remediation practices using terms like high, medium, low, in removing MDMA, making the interpretation and in comparison to the Ontario drinking water standards to be difficult, especially when the articles were written for the regions like United States. Our, our significant findings um, addressing MDMA and drinking water, we found it, this to be crucial for our public health and environmental safety as well. Um, exceeding the environmental, the Ontario drinking water standards for MDMA and in drinking water poses a significant health risk to the public as it's considered a carcinogenic. All remediation practices in this research have shown to be effective in removing MDMA from the groundwater, which can be potentially apply to the Amira, Amira aquifer. However, it's important to note that to treat the MDMA, MDMA would most likely need a multi-step approach. Um, we would also like to, so that's um, kind of what our research was all about. Um, we just wanna take the time to thank Ulysses and Ken and Lanx Canada for their cooperation and support in our research. And then Nathan as well for bringing it to Ulysses as well. Well, and we <clears throat> owe you a debt of gratitude as well um, for taking this on and, and spending you know, months of your time engaging in research uh, and writing report uh, for, for us. Um, you know, to, to mull over and see if we can pull items out of that uh, to, to help us. So, um, you know, on behalf of the committee, we thank you not only for the work that you've done, but for also coming in and giving us this presentation here tonight to give us a sense of the work that you had done. So thank you for that. Um, I'll open it up to see if there's any comments or questions from the committee to either Dr. Klee or to the student researchers. Sebastian? Sure, I can serve up. Thank you very much, uh, Lady Sadie and Ben Nadia, for this. This is actually wonderful news. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the uh, research? Um, are these from articles uh, outlining um, campaigns in other jurisdictions? And the, the results were that some of these uh, methods here proved very effective. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is this theoretical or is this backed up by more practical um yeah practical um how should i say it um practical results sorry Does that question makes sense or um so like for our a lot of the articles that we found um in the process um were a lot of them were kind of the United States. So we had to kind of, I guess, do like we wanted more of a Canadian standard or an Ontario drinking water standard. Um, so the only ones that we really found, I believe, were the propane oxidizing bacteria was used in one of the was like a, I think it was a 20 year research. 
um, for a plant in, in the United States. And then uh, the UV was, I think, Lanix uses it. Um, and then also they, in, I think it's Oshweken, there was kind of a similar incidence where that happened and they used UV. Um, so that was more closer to the Ontario water drinking standards that they could get. So does that answer? Getting, getting close, Nadia. I, I'm just wondering the, uh, the supportive evidence that you have, it's based on actual successes uh, or actual attempts in other jurisdictions to, uh, to control NDMA or to remediate NDMA. So these are not theoretical approaches. These are actually practical approaches that have been written about. And they are, by and large, successes? Or are there right. certain questions that have to be made about uh, the use of these, these methods? Yeah, so you're, you're, yeah, you're correct in that. Um, it was more or less, um, like, they're all researched um, articles that we were using or evidence-based articles that we were using um and they were in, like used in practical experiences with mdma um removal um i yeah i think there wasn't anything that we researched that was kind of just out there um the only thing that we kind of had difficulty was there was articles with like a multi-step approach so it wouldn't just be kind of one it would be maybe like one or two that would be fully or more effective than just one um approach to it i'm gonna go to you caesar so you put your hand up there and then i'll go over to you hadley okay yeah yeah i just wanted to add to what nadia was saying i think it is fair to say that that um many of the technologies that um nadia and sadia Sadie looked at have been tested at the very least right. and shown to be quite effective. And in fact, and Hadley might mention this as well, that some of them are actually being used currently by Lanxus. So they they are in um yeah, they have been proven to be effective. Um so I just wanted to add that. I don't know if Sadie wanted to, to contribute as well. You said the same thing as what I was going to say, Ulysses. I cut out there for the whole section, so. Thanks for that. Hadley, I saw that you had your hand up as yep. well. Yep. I have a question, then maybe I can add a little too if, if there's time. Well, thank you for this. This was interesting. What was the what was the most interesting thing that you found during your research? Like what stuck out to you that you might take on? Um, I enjoy like looking at the different remediation processes and actually getting the chance to go to Lanix. I didn't know about the situation until Nathan brought it to her attention. So thank you, Nathan, for that. Um, and Lanix was great with the tour. Like we got a tour of the facility and like see what they were using. So as Nadia said, they were using UV. So then we just got to see their whole process and what they're doing, try to like get the MDNA out of the river. Nadia, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, yeah, it was quite, it was almost, um, there's a lot of research out there for sure about MDMA and even chlorinated benzene. Um, so I found like a lot of the time we kind of had to, I guess, um, uh, I guess more like narrow our research down to more like MDMA um, but yeah, there's like a ton of research out on there for MDMA removal practices. And yeah, it was just very interesting to learn about um, this whole process and everything. Yeah, it was interesting for sure. Thank you. And so so I'm with Lanx, since I'm pretty new. Um, so my understanding is still pretty shallow on on a lot of these topics. I think some of, definitely a lot of these com the community members know more than I do, but the so just to describe a little bit, ex situ is when you're taking the water out like we are. We're pumping it out, we're treating it above ground, and then in situ, you're targeting where the mass is, and you're hoping you can make it a nice atmosphere for bugs that will degrade those compounds. I and it, and that works wonderfully when it's the right chemical, right? With the right compound that bugs can eat. Chlorinated solvents, they just love to eat those up. 
but the NDMA, I, you know, I'm not keen on bringing propane out into the neighborhood to try to do that in, in situ in the ground where the, where the NDMA is, because I, I think that has its own safety hazards and risks. Um, so we are at Langsys, we are using UV and, and carbon, um, gran granular activated carbon, and we have our own kiln so we can recharge the carbon and not have a, a lot of waste and so forth. But it is really energy intensive and it does a great job of cleaning the NDMA out, right? It's, it's there, we, we can, the water at the end of the line that goes into the creek, you can drink. Now where we're stuck a little bit is that the NDMA is still stuck in the aquifer. There's areas where, um, you know, we're sucking from straws, the wells are straws, and the NDMA might be over here, we just can't get to it. Um, or there might be silt or some other type of uh, geological challenge, I'm gonna call it, that it's hung up in, in, in the soil itself and not necessarily mobile that we can get it with the ex situ treatment. So that's where I'm going is kind of next steps. And I'm really challenging GHD and WSP to say, what can we do? Because uh, the 2028 um, year is out there and we want to achieve it, but just because we've removed so much mass, but there's still th this area that we need to further target on um, to, to, to get there with ex situ treatment. Nope, so thank you. This was really informative. Any other questions or comments? Brian? Uh, thank you uh, also for uh, the research that you did. I just have one question based on the scale. Uh, your research was using these different methods to remove the MDNA and chlorobenzene from the water, but on what scale? We're talking about a very large scale here, and where your examples from uh, similar municipal water supplies, or was it done, it would be a whole lot easier to re remove MDNA from a swimming pool size water as opposed to an aquifer. So I'm wondering if these studies actually took into account the scale of uh, remediation that is required. Maybe. I, I can offer a, a bit of a, a response to that. From my understanding, a lot of the technologies that uh, Sadie and Nadia looked at are scalable. Um, it really does depend on, you know, the, the size of the remediation effort is very much going to be dependent on the volume of water that needs to be treated. Um, but activated charcoal or granulated granular carbon is a great example where more water more carbon um uv as well you just have more cells uv cells more energy as, yes as Hadley mentioned it it's the cost that uh increases as well i think our plant does I th i'm you know i'm getting a lot of information right i've only been here two months but it's what is it two million gallons per day so it's a it it i was certainly impressed when I saw the, and I'm, and I'm not trying to plug Langsys, right, but it's a city-sized treatment process that they have. And, um, you know, it's one, at least one full-time operator 24-7. It's not a small scale. Um, I'll take one opportunity to just pick up on one of the significant findings that you mentioned, because I think that it is worth noting the last one. It's important to note that the treat NDMA would most likely mean multiple step approach. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Um, you know, what exactly do you mean and, and what's kind of brought you to that conclusion? Um, yeah, so like we in our research, we found it more, I guess we were trying to focus on just one approach at a time. Um, but when we were looking at a lot of the articles, they had um, a few approaches. So they would have UV, they would have the activated carbon, they would have um, the reverse osmosis. So it wasn't just one, like we would, it was more difficult to find just a singular one than rather than multiple ones. But I feel like a lot of the time we found people were using different um, 
I guess, processes. So they would be using either reverse osmosis plus UV or reverse osmosis plus granulated um, activated carbon. Um, so I just, we just found it was more better, it was better to have the multi-step approach because there was more research done on those. It was just finding um, that. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think each each individual approach had a certain efficiency, and it's when you sum them or put them in a series that those efficiencies um, added up and provided a much better result in the end. The only other question that is kind of nagging at the back of my mind is we are reaching a point here in Elmira where it is becoming acetonic to remove some of this NDMA. Was there anything that you came across in any of your research that specifically looked at sites that may have reached this state and what could potentially be done differently other than the exit you pump and treat type things? Um, for that, we I don't think we came across that more or less. Um, I feel like a lot that would be another probably research project as well, um, in addition to this one, so. Well, I'm lying then, I have one more question. If you could, uh, <laughs> if you could make a suggestion to potential future researchers, where would you steer them? What would you highlight as a potential avenue they may want to explore further, especially as it relates to Elmira's aquifer? Um, I um, would, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I would say probably focus on two. So like reverse osmosis and UV and then have both of them and then their pros and cons. And then you go from there. I would just focus on two because those are the two that we came across mostly if they were um, a multi-step approach, I believe, right, Nadia? And then I would maybe like the next people do the research can like take another tour of Lanx again and then see how far they have came from like when we toured. Uh, just, just to clarify, it's my, that I heard you correctly. It's it's only the, um, the, the propane biological treatment that that is, that can be used in situ in the aquifers to reduce the NDMA within the aquifer. Is that correct? All the others are after you extract the water. I'm going to call on Ulysses uh, for the answer to this question, maybe. Um, I'm not aware of another in situ method that would be effective against NDMA. Um, but that that would be a good area of research, I think, to investigate um, other other possibilities. Yes, but Hadley said it poses safety risks to have the propane around. Um, so I'm kind of interested in that. Can you elaborate on that, Hadley? I, I'm I'm not really familiar with the in situ with the propane, but I think you have to inject propane into the ground, and propane's mm -hmm. explosive, so I it would have to be out in the community in tanks, and I don't right. know at what scale, right? I, I have no idea on that. I think a lot of this has been laboratory size, so I, I'm not sure how um, how much practical um, treatment there is on this one. I'm gonna be look. It's part of my learning curve. But it's, you know, I I just don't see that as a good idea, right? Putting propane in the community. <laughs> Would it also target chlorobenzene, um, the propane? If only... I don't know enough about it, but chlorobenzene, there are other ways to clean it up in situ. However, the NDMA just, it's hard to destruct that compound, right? The, U, the ultraviolet is the way mm -hmm. that knocks it out. Gotcha. Yep. So we would still have, have NDMA. 
Any other comments, Sebastian? Just a point of clarification. Several years ago, um, an in, in situ um, proposal was made, and the chemical that was going to be injected, I think, was magnesium or potassium permanganate in large quantities. And apparently that had some impact on NDMA. Uh, and there was supposed to be a trial of this, and we're talking about probably almost 10 years ago now, which never really got off the ground because it was uh, it was either deemed too complicated or too expensive by the company at the time. Um, but I'm wondering, does anybody remember or know whether there are other um, chemicals that actually can be put into the ground in situ to counteract NDMA? See Tiffany with her hand up. I don't know if it's to answer your question, Sebastian. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. If anybody else does, I would welcome it at this point. I mean, I appreciate that you know pump, pumping in um, propane might have some complications. Okay, but there might be some safer alternatives, and I wonder if that's ever been explored or ever. If you, uh, if our researchers here have ever come across alternatives to propane. I, uh, if I if I could just jump in for a moment, um, one thing about in situ remediation is that you have to really understand the in situ conditions. Uh, for example, a big 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 div dividing line is whether it's aerobic or anaerobic conditions that the compound breaks down in. So, for example, chlorobenzene prefers to break down or is more readily broken down under anaerobic conditions, and it would not require the same, what we call a substrate or the active ingredient to help the microbes, in situ microbes to break it down as the NDME, uh, the microbes that would be preferentially uh, utilizing NDMA as an energy source or as, as the uh, substrate. So there's, there's a lot of um, science and understanding that's behind these in situ approaches. And I guess I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that, that uh, characterizing the site is a very big part. Now, thankfully, we have a lot of data here in Elmira that really it's a very well characterized aquifer system. Um, so we should be able to uh, explore some of these options, but I would caution us to think that it's gonna be one particular in situ approach. I, I don't believe that's realistic, but um, targeted in situ approaches may very well be uh, be available. But it's, it is quite an involved process to get to that point where you're injecting in situ. So I just wanted to add that uh, to the additional question marks that are out there. Thanks, Tiffany. Ulysses, I see your hand. Yes, I just wanted to add a little bit of my own experience with permanganate as to why it might have been um, discontinued or not pursued. Um, I know that um, it was a very popular chemical to use with organics. It's a strong oxidizing agent, so it tends to break things down, but it does have a relatively limited uh, field of, 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 um, of action. So you can inject it and it creates a, a, a small zone around the, the well um, where you get relatively clean clean water or disinfected water. But um, yeah, it, it tends to have a pretty severe limitation. So it, it was sold as a as a sort of a silver bullet, but in the end it didn't do it didn't typically do what was what was originally hoped. Um so that's that's yeah that's the experience I've had with with using that. All I can add is that um, something like that was I think attempted about ten years ago in the south end of town uh, by I believe it was Cantura, and uh, that experiment didn't last very long. I'm not sure exactly why it, it wasn't pursued. It might have been a cost issue um, or the initial results were poor, negative. I don't know. But uh, there was something attempted about 10 years ago, and I believe it was potassium permanganate that was the, the uh, oxidizing agent that was used at the time. But that's, that's, all I, that's all I recall. 
Well, I do thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Thank you. I just want. I just want. I, no questions. I just want to comment. I, I read the. I read the. Uh, the report that was put together, and I thought it was. It was very easy to read and very well done. Which, from a lay person's point of view, was very helpful. But from my perspective, and going through the monthly reports, and as has been noted already um, by both uh, Sadie and Nadia and and Hadley, that they're using the carbon process and also the UV process. It kind of just, when I was reading through and I saw that, I went, well, that, you know, if those are two treatment systems that they found to be effective in their in their research and it is being used. And uh, so that kind of made me feel pretty good that, that that's, you know, that's two good options. I think the, the outstanding issue is what we've been talking about and it's a collection side of of the system and not so much the treatment side of the system. That's yeah. that's our problem right now. Perhaps, you know, we continue these conversations, um, <clears throat> you know, with potential future researchers who could look at something specific like that. So uh, on behalf of the committee, again, uh, Nadia, Sadie, thank you so much for the work that you've done. Um, really do appreciate it. And thanks again for coming in and, and delivering this presentation to us. Ulysses, thank you again um, for your oversight and uh, for making this happen. I really do appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. All right, folks. So that brings us to the end of item six on the agenda. <clears throat> Moving to item seven, that's the review of Lancis, the April monthly progress report. So Linda, I'm gonna pass this one over to you to walk us through. Of course, and I didn't print it off today. I'm going to do this really quick here then. I think I can remember some of the stuff because I oh, it's coming up. The monthly report. So um, from the well, the collection and treatment system side of things. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. Um, I it's up. Thanks, Stacy. I got it. Thanks. Okay. So W3R from the collection and treatment side was shut down in October. Then this is still going back, just um, continuing on with it um, due to some problems that have been noted in past summaries. Um, and part of that was that they were um, had put out a tender to um, have some wireless equipment ordered and installed and the expected date on that Hadley might be able to help with that was to be May 17th. So I don't know if they've got that wireless equipment put in in order to to help resolve the issues with WR3, but May 17th was... I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head. I would need to well, get back to you. No, nope, that's fine. Thank you. Um, We've talked about PW6 is almost ready um, to come online. Um, the well was being connected to the existing treatment system in order to bring it online. So that's what was going on for the April report. W5A pumping rate was decreased from April 9th to April 16th as a result of a high pressure in the W4 carbon absorber. Um, it was rechanneled temporarily, temporarily reducing high pressure but allowed W5A to return to its target um, rate for the rest of the month. Um, chlorobenzene was detected um, from the collection treatment system in the GE effluent sample that was collected on April 2nd. It was also noted in the collection on April 16th. It was also detected in the SFE effluent sample collected on April 2nd, but not in the one at that location on April 16th. Um, they noted in the report that the total combined discharge effluent concentration, so from the two sites for, for chlorobenzene, was greater than the effluent objectives of 0.5, but less than the limit of, of 10 micrograms per liter. Um, it also notes the results may be attributed to W4 and W9 treatment systems. So Lanix has ordered carbon for the carbon absorbers to, uh, to, to, to help resolve this issue. Um, however, that can't be done while WR3 is shut down as the absorbers cannot be backwashed during the replacement process. So they're continuing to monitor all of this. So there's, there's that interconnection in the system that's 
that may cause some delays on, on treating that as well. Uh, toxicity, no acute toxicity found in any of the samples. Um, in the April, it was the quarterly receiver water quality data came through. Um, pH, formaldehyde, and total phenols are found in sampling. And typically when I do the summaries, there's a lot of times we, we know formaldehyde and total uh, phenols in the water quality being a little higher than, than normal. Uh, pH was also found this time. It was found in samples upstream of the site. Um, formaldehyde was detected in one sample collected from surface water monitoring station SS925. But the reports note that it was only one sample location um, and that the results then may not necessarily be related to site activities, but more in, um, in the way it was collected or in um, lab variability reporting. What they did note was that none of the detections were defined as exceedances by the ECA in the, in the samples. So groundwater elevation monitoring was also, I think it's semi-annual, semi-annual groundwater. Yes, it's now semi-annual. Um, and gotten a lot of notes in the summary, but in essence, I think uh, cutting that down for uh, time, it's what they noted in the elevations is that basically in some locations through the monitoring process and the sampling of the elevations that there was a loss of containment and which is also noted in the in the report that um, they did have a loss of containment in the groundwater elevation monitoring in April. Um, Lannix, as per usual, because we know it only is on other times, followed the ECA requirements. They collected samples during this period and there were no adverse impacts noted. Um, the other thing that was done with the groundwater that's usually done on that semi-annual basis is the monitoring of the century wells. And the results from the monitoring of the century wells continues to show a 50% non-detect to decreasing trends for NDMA in those wells that were um, monitored and 100% to 50% non-detect to decreasing trends for chlorobenzene. That's highlighted somewhere. Very well. Any comments or questions after hearing the summary from Linda? Sebastian? Sorry, Linda, could you just uh, go in a little bit more detail about the loss of containment? What did the report say about loss of containment again? So I think it was, I think the the time of year as usual with April and the, the freshet, but it also coincided at this particular point in time with their groundwater elevation monitoring. So they were able to note um, in a number of locations where that containment. Um, so there was a difference between the groundwater and surface water elevations um, noted on April 24th, and this was beneath the northwest portion of the site. Um, the dam on the creek has, has been modified um, for the natural UA1 groundwater flow conditions. Uh, surface water impounded behind the dam and this resulted in groundwater immediately west and north of the dam to flow southwest away from the creek. So loss of containment. And this flow path typically leads to groundwater discharge south of the dam, but seasonally high surface water elevations in the creek prevented this. Um, I think I also... can try to simplify it if that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Right. So you, I think, I think most people maybe know that streams are either gaining or losing. So when it's dry in the summer, they're losing their water. It's going into the surrounding area. In the spring, there's so much water coming into them, they're gaining. So this happens in the spring. We need, this is, I think it's specific to the plant area itself, right? We have extraction wells on site at the plant that we're treating the water. And we basically have to keep the water lower than the creek. But when it's when it's so much rain and so much infiltration from precipitation or melt events, it's hard to keep up with that. So we have a loss of containment. Our water at the plant is maybe higher so that it's, it's gaining into the stream. But it's also the most diluted because there's so much water in this in there that we don't have exceedances into the creek. Um, it, it's it's seasonal, right? Is what it, where if hopefully that helps and makes sense because. If it were, it's it's not something that's going to happen in the summer when we wouldn't have that dilution effect because there's not enough water. You know, the ground's not saturated, um, the water elevation's not that high. 
Did that help? Help me, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mary Sean? Yeah, just to follow up on that, when that happens, do we actually test the creek? I can't remember where Jason maybe could add the specifics. I don't I don't know if we're yes, testing but thank you. <laughs> Phoning a friend. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so for the a uh, few years back when Lanxess approached the ministry for uh, amending the ECA um, specifically for reductions in monitoring reporting conditions under the ECA for the the groundwater treatment system. Uh, one of the asks or requests from the ministry was, well, we did agree with all the, you know, 20, 30 years of data to uh, many of the requests for the monitoring reporting reductions. One of the additions or data gap that we noticed over the years is, while well, Lexus was collecting a lot of surface water data, it was predominantly during uh, non-storm events. So we didn't have a lot of wet weather high water level data to support that uh, any uh, short term so-called loss of containment was not having a, a potential adverse effect on the creek system. So as a result, we, we, we requested that monitoring be done during periods where their uh, water levels indicate that um, uh, they've so-called lost containment. And it's usually a couple of specific wells that are quite commonly doing this just in the spring spring months. So as a result, now today's um, ECA, it requires in that when that circumstance occurs that GHD goes out to collect surface water samples as close as possible to that event uh, to show that um, there is no negative effect on, on water quality. Thank you. Yeah, it's routine, sir. They collected it on April 5th and a couple of other times that we've been reporting. Thanks, Linda. All right, so we have three updates from Lanxis. So have we, um, you're going to be speaking to the hair revisions, the creek hotspots, and the plan uh, biomonitoring program? Yes. Um, do you all see my slides? Do I need to present them? Uh, you should be able to share screen if you're not Okay. Oh, I don't use Zoom much. Give me a second. Do you want me to share it for you? We can do it on that our end, too. Please do, if you don't mind. Um, um, Yeah, I'm not seeing a quick button to share. Oh, I see it now. Do you want me to share? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. The race is on. <laughs> That's right. All right. Now I need to figure out how to make it in the center. Hmm. I'm sharing them, but you can't see them, can you? No, no, yeah, no. Uh, there we go. How does that look? You can resize it with your uh, up and down arrows there on the far left, right on the far right bottom. Oh. The plus and minus. The plus and minus in the last. That's. Yeah. Down, down, down. 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 Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. Good. It it's all like going backwards for me, too. So it's it's like a skill test. Okay, there we go. How's that? Perfect. So the I my updates, I, I just don't have a lot of depth yet. And I do apologize. And I thank you all for bearing with me. But the replacement well, we have it drilled and developed and we're getting the instrumentation. We do still plan for summer 2024 and to have the well operational by the end of this year. We're on track. We're actually probably a little ahead of schedule, but I think you all are aware of the supply chain issues that we've faced since post COVID. So um, we hopefully will be able to continue to be ahead of, ahead of the timeline there. The Creek risk assessment, I, um, we, there was a good conversation with the ministry yesterday about our responses. I'm trying to really understand that and where we need to focus on our revisions and our responses to the ministry. 
we did submit initial comments at the end of May and we asked for a more formal meeting. This, this was more of a, not an informal meeting, but it wasn't with all of the technical resources. It wasn't with my technical team, nor with the ministry's technical team. So it was more just kind of understanding how to execute it for the next meeting. So we'll have a very technical discussion and finalize that report. And I know a lot of you are waiting for it, but really at this um, le level, we're just trying to work out some of the technical details and then we'll get it completed and resubmitted to everyone. There's uh, we're also going to be adding some data. The ministry collected soil samples from the floodplain along the creek, and we'll be adding that data as, as well before we submit the final. And this, this bullet, the risk assessment findings and outcome will determine next steps on our request to do voluntary work on the creek. I'm not saying we're not, I mean, we're going to do voluntary work on the creek, but I just wanna make sure that the outcome of the risk assessment doesn't obligate us to do something, right? Because that, that might be the work that we do if it's sufficient. So we really wanna make sure we get that wrapped up before we do the voluntary work because it, it could be different, it could be the same. We wanna understand if there's a regulatory obligation first before we do voluntary on the targeted areas of the creek. Are there any questions so far? Just with timeline then, um, based on that, if we're looking, we're gonna submit the final era later in 2024. If I were to try to pin you down on a, a month, would you be able to provide a response? For submittal of the H eight of the risk assessment, yeah. Um, I'm I'm gonna say late summer, right? But but the the targeted work probably I'm guessing is not gonna be this year. And I know a lot of people were hopeful and hoping we would get there, but I think because we won't have comments from the ministry either. You know, we'll submit the report, but there won't be comments, and I'm I'm sure that takes a while too to digest and review. So I think we're back in, we're into the next season to do the work next summer. Questions? Is there another question? Sorry. No, nope, I'm not seeing any from you, Hadley. Okay. And then on the Creek, the clan biomonitoring program, again, it, it kind of it ties a little bit with the risk assessment, right? So what are we finding in the data and the fish tissue data? What do we need to continue monitoring long-term to help us with our ECA permit? The biomonitoring is a um, requirement of the ECA permit. So it's it's maybe seen, I, I think a lot of you know that we can't get clams. The I'm gonna forget the name of the, the natural resource department. Um, it, it's really hard to take clams from one tributary and put them in another one for a science, pro for research for, for this type of work. So we're unlikely to get that approval to move clams to do the biomonitoring like we always have. And instead we'll have to look at something else. So maybe it will be fish tissue data. And that could also be an outcome of the risk assessment. Perhaps the ministry will request fish. I'm just guessing, I don't know, but maybe something like doing fish tissue monitoring every three to five years. And that could be incorporated as our biomonitoring portion of the ECA. And then the last bullet is about the 2028 timeframe. And really, it, Ramin's been real upfront with you. We're not gonna hit 2028. It wasn't a deadline. It was a target um, based on 30 years ago when people said, we're all gonna be retired, let them figure it out by then. And now, you know, here I am, I'll probably be the one living the 2028 deadline. That is a target. <laughs> so we'll, um, I'm really pushing GHD and WSP and my consultants, like this is what I like. I like to try to figure out the hard problems. How do we get the last of this mass out of there? And it's almost like, I'm gonna say, shake up the aquifer. And I mean that as a, as a it, it might be from sparging a well, like pulling in this area, then pulling in that area, because you gotta, we have to kind of move the mass so that we can get to it. So I'm asking them to look at, we have all the tools with the Joe Ricker plume analytics and like Susan said, this aquifer has been really studied. We have a lot of the information. So how can we maybe work inside the box and look at it differently to understand how we can affect change to get it flowing towards us better so that we can extract the remaining mass? So that's in the works. I don't have a deadline on that either yet. 
One thing I wanted to note, Hadley, with respect to that last bullet, is the 2028 deadline is indeed a target. Um, but as a, a council, I think that we've brought that forward by a couple of years, um, at least having that discussion. I think that when we're talking about a remedial framework, we would really like to have a solid proposal in place by 2026, not necessarily by Absolutely. 2028. Yes, um, no, I totally agree with you. So I suppose this is going to be something that I'm going to continue to uh, ask at each meeting is where we stand with uh, this proposal. Um, okay. Because I think that it is something that this committee is eager to see, um, you know, what the response with the ministry would be based on that proposal, because I think that's one of the key pieces um, that's going to set the tone for how we proceed moving forward. I think that's fair, right? Challenge me, remind me. I, I agree with you. I want to keep it moving as well. It's front on my burner. and But the remediation is slow, right? I, I think you all kind of realize this. So the not the problem, but the challenge is we might pilot something for a while to see if it works. So we, we may have ideas and we may say we want to pilot this. It could, it could take a year to do that pilot test, right? And then the results may not be favorable, so we have to do the next pilot test. And it, but it's all getting us towards the end end target of how to remove the remaining mass. But it it will be a iterative pro process. If I can make a comment, um, I, just in the spirit of kind of today's discussion, I wonder if it's something that you can take to GHD and and ask them if they've done an exhaustive look at uh, mm -hmm. in situ treatment technologies and perhaps provide us with uh, a document or a summary of which ones have been tried, the, the institute chemical oxidation, I think with permanganate, I, I do recall that happening some years ago as well. Yep, I, I made and, a note too. I'm curious to understand that study. Mm -hmm. But, and, and the, the bioremediation techniques, like if, if they're plausible or not, then why not? You know, like it would be nice to have some follow up from the technical side as, as to the plausibility of these technologies. I'd say that's fair okay. as well. So a little, just to follow up on both uh, Carl's comments and um, the proposal you were talking about, Hadley. So the last number of years we've been talking about this topic of now what in terms of trying to meet that target or not meet that target. Uh, Lanxus and GHD worked in the background and created two documents. One was a remediation framework and one was an updated review of technologies that could be used for treatment both in situ and ex situ. Those documents are now more than five years old. And I think what uh, Tiffany and I had talked about was one of the early steps before, hopefully, a, 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 a unit, sorry, sorry a, a one, maybe, don't take this the wrong way, I don't have the right words, but a one-sided proposal from Lanxus back to everybody to respond to would be a, bet, a better approach would be, can we get all the experts, the technical experts together to see whether those two documents are still up to date. There's been a lot of additional hydrogeologic work that has been conducted by uh, Lanxus and their consultants over the last five to seven years that wouldn't have been part of things. And I'd still like to know whether that framework and those technologies are still valid for considering moving forward. So I, I think what we had hoped for was uh, and had proposed to Ramin was some sort of technical experts meeting where the hydrogeologists could sit down in the room and have a, a frank scientific discussion about the feasibility or the engineers as well, and the feasibility of some uh, of the technical side of things. Um, ministry included as well, because they have uh, experts as well, the region obviously. Um, and and that would be a good starting point for engaging. Uh, and Hadley, I I would suggest would be a good uh, would be a good initiation for you to really sink your teeth into some of these technical aspects that need to be considered as we move forward on this issue. Okay. 
Yep. T no, Tiffany cited the same document to me. So I, I agree. And, and essentially what I'm, my next steps are to work with GHD and WSP's hydrogeologists, just like you're saying, to get the ideas. And then you're right, we'll bring them to the ministry, we'll bring them to the group and move forward that way. I, I think we're aligned. And, I, I'm, and I'm the first to say, if in the way consultants work, right, they're always going to conferences and they're, they're listening to peer reviews. If, if there were a magic bullet for NDMA in situ, they, we'd be the first to hear. I just don't think there is one out there right now. Um, I, and I, I not agree with you. I don't think there is either, which is why we're sitting here and why we've been sitting here for all, over five years, recognizing that there isn't a magic bullet out there. And the problem is not the treatment technology. The problem is getting the groundwater or getting the treatment into the into the remedial, into the ground to treat that last little bit. We know we can treat it once we get it out. We just can't get it out. And I think we are aligned that we want to work cooperatively in coming to this conclusion. And I guess I I I would I would rather us not get something as a solid proposal coming from Lancis and, and its consultants before we sit down and have an opportunity to discuss it okay. in a more uh, interactive way. Uh, so that, uh, you know, as they're getting their thoughts together, uh, then, then we have sure. an opportunity to make sure that our perspectives are being heard collectively. Uh, I 100% um, hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because that, I mean, that's, I have to tell my, I'm the client, right? I have to tell the consultants, I want to be on part of those discussions because they want to have those behind the scenes. And that's where the magic happens, right? When people throw out ideas. So for sure, I'll make sure that we're, that we bring you into it. We'll do uh, Councillor Schwint and then you, Ryan. Okay, glad to hear that, Abby. Eric made a really good point there. Well, everybody wants to carry the process. I want to go back to the here report. I think there's a lot of back and forth happening over the next six months comments and being digested, that type of thing. We can't do the clams this year. As these reports are going back and forth, though, we seem to be losing a year and not doing any actual mediation or projects. And we have the hotspot project, I guess they're waiting. What prevents that from moving forward? Um, I don't think it's going to impact any obligations six months from now once that reports agreed to by Lancs of Ben Ministry. So what I guess I'm wondering why we're missing out the summer. Do you From my perspective, if the ministry asks us to do cleanup in certain areas, I want to make sure I preserve Lancs's spend to do those, right? Like what if it's a different rationale on the targeted hotspots versus what we've been discussing? So it's a, I understand your point. Um, and also it's it's the same where I, I, I've done cleanups in creeks. It can also be fairly destructive, right? Like it takes down trees that have been growing for years. So I really wanna make sure we get it right. And we're in alignment with what the ministry obligates Lanxus to do and what's right for the community. So I, I think spending this year to ensure alignment is important. Ryan? Yeah, hi. So yeah, Hadley, just on the clam biomonitoring point, and I think we made note of this, but I, you know, and you're just coming online and and you're in the States, I'm sure. But um, just to bring you up to speed, like the previous biomonitoring, they proposed using clams that a species, Eastern Elliptio, that's not present in the Grand River watershed. So that's why the MNRF pushed back on it. And so there are a number of species within the Grand River, Grand River watershed that could be used in a clam biomonitoring project that the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry would sign off on. And I know that because in mining environmental effects monitoring in Ontario, they often use clams um, and as long as they're in sort of that watershed, they can be used, okay. they can be relocated to do upstream, downstream, in situ monitoring. So it, it yeah, I, I, they're right. Under the previous proposed biomonitoring, they wouldn't be able to because they're choosing a species that isn't present in this region of Ontario. And that was the issue with MNRF. Now, if they chose a species that was present and plentiful 
in the Grand River watershed, the MNRF, I'm, I'm almost 99% because I've seen it done elsewhere. Um, and I've done it myself would, would do that, would allow that. So okay. just Thank a heads up. That. Like if, that, that's helpful. That's, yeah, so I'll follow I mean, up on a, that. A part of it is the expertise of your consulting group, right? And so, right, you know, whether they have done these types of things or they're aware of, you know, mm -hmm. freshwater mussel biology within Southern Ontario, that kind of thing. I mean, it's sort of a niche thing, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, so just, just a heads up on that. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thank you for that uh, point because I, I was a, a bit discouraged to see the GHD proposal um, because it didn't seem to illustrate much understanding of uh, creek biology and how it can be tested and what needs to be done to test certain aspects of it. So I just wonder if you can encourage GHD to get the expertise that okay. they may not have to uh, to pursue uh, something that works to get the information we need. Okay, I sure will. That's really good advice. I appreciate it. One of my closest friends is the CEO of EnviroScience, which is a niche company in the states that does a lot of biomonitoring with muscles and and so forth. So I, I I've been trying to get his attention too to see if he can help me on that. Um, and I did, Lou replied to me while we were talking that the one well in the update has been up and running since the end of May, W3R. So um, to circle back on that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for the updates, Linda? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, well, no, I'm not devil's advocate, but I, I, taking the point about the hot spot and, and hearing what Hadley said, and, and it's something I've kind of, I think I'm maybe kind of out here on myself, but I, I appreciate that, the fact, and, and that I don't want, I personally, and this is probably coming from Ted, but I personally would not want to see areas of the creek chewed up and, and tried to clean up um, if it's not the right spots to be um, targeting, because I don't think we want to be looking at another environmental issue on another scale, not maybe not a contamination issue, but another another one without really having all our, our eggs and understanding um, the complete picture before we move ahead. So uh, while it may be quite a time lag from where we started, and I appreciate that, I think it's probably prudent to wait until we get those results to see whether there is any recommendations or suggestions and then we can you know, put our thoughts together and move forward where we should be targeting things. Just my yeah, I, and I agree with you, Linda. I think it makes sense to finish the risk assessment, um, and because it, it's a complicated thing to do, even a small uh, remediation along the creek, and to get ducks in a row first. I agree with that. I would also add, though, that uh, the areas that I've looked at along the creek, um, where we've suggested uh, it would that might be targeted near residences and so on um, are not heavily treated in those areas. There are heavily treated parts of the creek, but those are not the spots where uh, um, many hot spots have been found. All right, folks, thanks for that discussion. Um, I found that to be very helpful. And in fact, uh, number nine on the agenda, the 2028 order deadline. Jason wanted to ask something. Sorry, Jason. I just carried right on, uh, <laughs> not even paying attention. Go ahead. No, no, no worries. Uh, I just want to follow up on on the information provided by uh, Ryan. Thanks for, for adding that, that information. Um, I did follow up uh, a while back with ministry scientists on this and the clams and and the one a couple of comment points that were made is that had to be considered uh, with respect to using native clam species within the Grand River watershed is number one we have to consider where the site is in relation to like for example where's your source going to come from for these uh, native clams 
um, taking them from the Grand River is downstream of not only Lanxess, but various other um, inputs into the creek system. So we'd be, you know, hypothetically looking for sources of clams uh, upstream uh, of the Lanxess property, number one. And number two, is the population big enough to provide the quantity that would be needed for continuing the clam study? Um, without having a negative impact on the actual native population itself. So, so there are various aspects that have to be uh, considered uh, when yeah, looking and at And I that. mean, my saying, mine is if, if you have, like if a group has enough, like there is for sure. Yeah. They answer those questions, but you've got to have knowledge of that, right? And so you got to reach out to the right experts to know that, right? Those are easy ways of saying, well, it can't be done, this, you know, and, oh, I'm not saying that. No, it can't be but done. I'm just saying. Uh, this I'm just saying, saying like in general. Out, so, <laughs> in, yeah, no, but I'm just saying in general, like you got to reach out to the experts. And I know, I you know, that within uh, consulting, you know, you're you're trying to keep it in shop and 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 deliver to your 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 uh, customer. And, no, and, I'm trying to use the right tool. No, no, and I'm not saying you. I'm yeah. just saying, oh, okay. you know, yeah, 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 what yeah. you're relying, you know, and I'm not saying anything against GHD, but I, you know, there there are expertise, but if if somebody was to consult you know experts in the field and reach out to people they would be able to find species that i mean i know my like there are spe there are large populations of of species and the other thing you can do to confirm because if you're using it as a way of monitoring right like contaminants is you know if you have a potential source population look at it measure the contaminants that are present in it right to say you know what are we starting with right what's our baseline are these a valid population to be used? Uh, because if they're contaminated with the contaminant you're trying to biomonitor, then it's pointless, right? But there's work you can do ahead of time to confirm that and say that, you know, this is a healthy, stable, large population. They're, you know, uh, virtually the whatever contaminants are below the detection limit. And so they would be a good tool to use in clam biomonitoring. So I mean, if if there's a decision not to do it, that's that's one thing. But it's it's not. I would say it's not because it's not possible. It's there would have to be for other reasons. But that that's a bigger discussion, right? Thanks, Brian. Going once, going twice. Um, what I was saying is that in number nine, it's the 2028 order deadline. And I think that we naturally covered some of the items that I had hoped that we would cover in our last conversation, um, certainly around a uh, potential remediation proposal um, coming out of uh, an experts meeting uh, from Lanxis, you know, engaging with ministry. Um, I want to keep this item on the agenda uh, as we move forward. Um, more as a reminder to us that this deadline is coming. Um, in the package, I think, Eric, if we go back to December RAC meeting, you had posed six questions. Um, so I just had asked that these be included once again, and I'm not suggesting that we take them item by item and come up with the answers because I don't think that we'll be able to. Um, but these are questions that have been certainly at the back of them my mind, and I'm sure that they've been at the back of the committee's mind as well. Um, so what are the next steps when it comes to answering some of these questions? You know, we heard from Ray today, and I think that some of the work that she had done with Engage Waterloo Region is amazing. Um, could we reformulate some of these questions to go out to the community and start getting their input as to what this looks like? Is that the best strategy? Um, is this something that we want to wrestle with here as a committee and maybe come up with um, some variations to these questions we feel that we can answer, that we can you know, provide some form of uh, value that Langsys could take back and uh, use as feedback to incorporate into that plan. So I didn't really have much in terms of what I wanted to discuss for item nine, uh, more or less wanted to open the floor to see if there were any thoughts on this item. Um, again, bridging from that conversation, I think that we already uh, waded into a little bit, 
perhaps, um, you know, we just need to sit with some of that a little bit longer. Um, but I think that we would be remiss not to at least try to wade through some of these questions each meeting that we come together. Eric? Just uh, I have one clarification point and one comment. Uh, first, these aren't my questions. These were questions that were generated at the time that the framework, the remediation framework in the Institute Cleanup uh, documents were created. And it was, I'm not exactly sure where they came from, uh, but it was it was part of a discussion, as I understand. Uh, the second thing is, these aren't the kinds of questions you want the public to try to answer, but they're not public questions. Many of them are regulatory, many of them are technical, so these are questions that have been sitting up there that we're no longer, we're sorry, we're no further ahead in answering than we were five years ago. Uh, we don't have answers. Well, we have some answers to these. Is the complete remediation possible? We're not using the current technology. So there's always a, a, a caveat to the answer. So I, I think it's it's fine or my suggestion would be it's fine to have these and bring them up as, as a discussion topic, but I really think we need to fine tune these questions to a different set of questions would be my suggestion to, to, to help us understand where this is going to go, because this isn't getting us anywhere. And I think it would be better if we had questions that could, you know, spur discussion that we could then, you know, uh, have with either Lanxus, the ministry, and the public yeah. as we move forward. Yeah. Okay, great. And I, I just like to certainly underline what you said about not presenting these to the public. We we need to, if we were going to ask questions of the public, we need to educate them first. We have to make it make the questions sensible and accessible and be sure that they kind of understand the context better because very few people do. Um, yeah, and I think to, just to respond to that, we had talked about, well, Tiffany mm -hmm. and I had talked forms. about, I think we even talked about it here at one of the earlier tag meetings or RAC meetings to develop um, uh, a, a simpler language explanation of where we are and how we got here. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's what we need to be able to provide to the public to get answers to whatever questions we want to pose to. And because you could you could add you could you could make the comment, you know, is it possible? Well, the comment often would come back, well, why haven't you done it yet? Why didn't you do this 30 years ago when we started this process? Well, there's a big history to that question. Um, that means it's not just a simple answer. And so if you're, if we're, and, and I don't want to, I mean, we'd end up sounding defensive as to why yes. the company chose this route and the ministry approved this route and we as a community collectively watched as this thing unfolded, uh, only to not be quite as successful as we might have liked um, collectively. So I, I don't want to be in that position no. of defending this. So I want to be in a position of to hopefully be, be promoting where we're going to go from here to try to move us a little bit more than where we are. Right. That's a fair point. Um, Tiffany, I saw you turn your camera on. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I just want to follow up uh, on uh, Eric's comment where these questions come from. They were questions that were basically the end of the draft framework document that's out there existing like the, it's the companion document to the uh, exploration of what uh, what technologies are available so it is it is five years plus old and as Eric noted like some of these questions have already been answered to a large extent uh, so completely concur with everything that's been said between Susan and, and Eric on this matter Suppose then the question that I have for the committee is, at what point do we retool these questions? Um, do we wait for a potential framework to come to us and then pose questions back? Or do we want to get our ducks in a row now and retool these questions um, maybe in advance of our next meeting in September? You know, we can 
have an item on the agenda that's the 2028 order deadline and we have a different list of questions that we can start to consider um ones that maybe we can bring to the public as well i'm just brainstorming uh Go well ahead. i i can add and, and maybe sebastian can can add to what i'm about to say um when we got this framework document i believe sebastian was the one who did the deeper dive on it and had some really good follow-up questions that he developed uh, for our tag group at the time. And um, I would have to go through the minutes to find that unless unless Sebastian would have that on hand readily. But there were some very good um, general public kind of questions that had value kind of statements. <clears throat> Having said that, I do think the the technical experts meeting that's been spoken about uh, earlier in this meeting, I think is a pretty critical first step. So if that could happen sometime before September, we might be in a better position to have some of these kinds of questions refined by the September meeting. That that, that would just be my comment on this. That's definitely good direction. Um, I like that, Sebastian. Um, I have to say that these questions look very familiar. Uh, my mind isn't <laughs> that adroit, I can't remember specifically, but I do recall that I did ask some of those questions. I'm, uh, I can't remember it was all six or, but I do remember asking those questions. And I have to say that, yes, the first one I think has been answered conclusively, and the answer is no, but the other questions are still valid. Now, we might want to reformulate some of these, but I think they're still valid questions. And I think it's imperative that we do have these questions posed to our experts as well as to Lanxis and any other party involved so that they are aware uh, of, of, of a fundamental concern that we have that we want addressed. And if you don't have questions, you can't expect answers. Um, so I would encourage us to reflect on the questions that are still outstanding. They could be reformulated. Undoubtedly, they, they might be five years old or so but they're still germane, they're still important. And the questions have a tendency of focusing and focusing people on whatever caliber on what needs to be done. And so I would urge the committee here to continue to look at these questions and say, uh, can we use those? Can we reformulate them? But still, they are a good, a good way in which to engender a, a response from people who, who probably can provide answers. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to figure out for sure what these frame or who these frame of questions are be used by. Um, do we want Lanxis and the ministry to be considering them during their, I guess, the negotiations, I'm going to call it? Is it for us to evaluate the outcome of the negotiations? Is it for the general public to use and evaluate the outcome? So I think that's my number one question on those questions. I'm also wondering if we're missing a component and that talking about the aquifer and cleaning it up, how do we value um, the existing water that's in that aquifer? So in theory, we could pump that aquifer dry and have it cleaned, but that's a waste of a whole lot of water that never come back to South Ontario. So how do we weigh that when we're evaluating our cleanup options? And what's containment versus cleanup? versus wasting resource. Not a good framework question. What can someone smarter than me <laughs> include in some seven or eight? I think those questions are really, really difficult to answer, Eric. And I don't think they're just beyond you or you. I think they're very difficult for any of us, frankly. I see three takers here that want to answer them. We'll start with David and we'll work our way down. I don't want to answer. I want to go back to question one. Um, it, it's not been answered because, uh, ironically, of all the questions, question one is the only changing question because we're five years off from the old one. So it might be after one week of looking into research or talking, it's like, okay, no, it's still not possible. And I think that's the caveat of question one is still not because it could be possible. And, and, and it's also asking the right questions in question one, right? We've seen from tonight, there's many ways to treat any of how do we get any of it is the real problem, right? I, I know it's there, I want it out, 
so I can treat it, but how do I? And then we heard um, Hadley mentioned spill it. You just, you just pump air in. Obviously, it's not air mobile, mm -hmm. but does that do anything? Is pumping more water into an aquifer? And then the, and these are not questions I want answered. These are just like you need to think that level because it's not about the treatment, it's about accessibility. Or is do we need five more wells? Or is it excited from our Joe Rickers diagram? It shrinks a little and then stops and keeps changing color. Um, meaning it's not actually mobilized by our wells because it's, it's had those years to diffuse. So I think just going back to that question one, it's been answered. It's been answered today. It has been answered tomorrow or the next day or the next mm -hmm. day or the et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so just keeping that in mind that the question one is not gone. And that's part of the, the technical, although updating the technical meeting is, well, has anything changed the last, I guess it, it seems like a five-year plan, which are always really good to start with. <laughs> but looking at it again saying did we miss something has something happened has anyone heard something you know the companies themselves are bigger um joe ricker was brought in when he wasn't wsp now he is wsp um things like that right the companies are growing they have more experience as well they suddenly brought someone in and they just haven't targeted this problem for them. Um, but just to keep in mind the question was an evolving potential question. Sure. Fair point. I, I just, this is sort of a side thing. I just feel uncomfortable with feeling the burden that a volunteer group here is, is somehow undertaking the task of figuring out this huge problem, this huge asking these complicated questions about complicated things that need so much technical expertise and so on. Where, what kind of initiative uh, should be placed on the company and the ministry who have funding, a mandate, and, uh, and expertise at their fingertips of some sort, and presumably the ability to seek to know what questions to ask and to seek other expertise if they don't have it. That's not our job, it seems to me, or it feels like it's an overwhelming task. Yeah, no, I tend to agree. And that's you know why I had almost framed it as uh, questions that we could pose back to the community because um, I think it's it's unfair for us for the expectation to be placed on the community to make these decisions on behalf of the community, but then it's unfair to the community members to not have that say as well. So I think it goes both ways and yeah. I definitely value what you're saying. I think it's relevant. Then did you have a comment? Um, well, it was kind of maybe changed a bit with the discussion, but looking at those questions, there's some that kind of allude to it. And it's one I've, you know, I've heard before in my in my work experience um, is that we're already so in it, and it'll become a perception question. It really will become a perception question. The water is coming out of the aquifer. It's being treated. The water is going into the river, and it's going into the river safe. Why can't we use it? I've heard engineers and other consultants for years when I worked in planning and we were putting in new sewage treatment plants and we always talked about the assimilation capacity of, of plants because you've got to assimilate this water into the stream and in some places you can't because there isn't, but yet they'll tell you that the water that's coming out is probably cleaner than the water that that might be being drank right now. So, but that becomes very, very, very perception oriented. And I think at the end of the day, that's where we're at. You can answer those questions any way you want, but it really comes down to an individual personal perception. And I think there's many, even if you go to the community, different community members are gonna have different perceptions. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Why are we wasting it? Let you know, I'm not doing So you're, you're gonna, and at the end of the day, we really don't have an answer. So I don't know. I don't know. It's a tough one. Oh. Sure. Ulysses, I see you have your hand up. Sorry if it's been up for a while. No, no, no. I, I I just wanted to to mention something, and I hope I don't get lynched for doing this. Um, one of the 
issues that seems to be missing from that list is an evaluation of the Ontario drinking water quality standards themselves. I think both for chlorobenzene and NDMA, those standards are pretty old. They date back, I think chlorobenzene dates back to the late 80s or early 90s. So a lot has happened since then. And I know that the approach used for chlorobenzene in particular is based on a very old methodology and um, is not even used currently. Um, they use this tenfold safety factor for each layer of conservatism that's that's associated with the, the toxicity data. And um, it, it actually introduces a 10,000 fold safety factor, which is quite large. Um, so, you know, when, when you talk about public perception, it might not be a bad idea to, to review those guidelines and standards. I know that other jurisdictions have, have, have different values for, for both of those chemicals. And, um, Again, it's unlikely that you're going to convince the Ontario Ministry of the Environment to change those values, but having an understanding of where those concentrations or where those uh, safe limits came from, the uncertainty associated with those, um, the conservatism that's built in to them might help give people some confidence in, 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 the, in the, gr the groundwater quality itself and maybe alleviate some of the concerns associated with minor exceedances that may occur from time to time. Um, again, it's just, I think it's valuable information and uh, it might be worth pursuing given again, the, the nature of those, those drinking water standards um, for these, for these two chemicals. I think that's definitely some valuable feedback that you've provided there. And I'm wondering, Jason, if I could put you on the spot, um, you know, what would the process be if we wanted the ministry to look into these? Uh, it would start with me re reaching out to our uh, water resources branch and having a discussion with them and, and getting all the historical background information on how these were established. I don't have those at my fingertips. So uh, as Ulysses mentioned, these Ontario drinking water standards for these two con key contaminants of concern were established uh, many, many years ago. So um, yeah, I'd have to look into uh, discussing that with ministry staff. I think that'll be paramount much to Linda's point. If we're going to be going to the public about the potential of consuming this water, we need to be very uh, mindful and ensure um, that the drinking water standards are um, to date and reflective of actual risk. Um, so certainly something to, to keep in mind. Sorry, yes. Um, so I had I was going to talk about the questions, but I think I need to make a comment uh, following up on Ulysses and Jason's comment. It is certainly my understanding that in the remediation of clean of uh, the cleanup of contaminated sites in Ontario, that the framework that's established set those sets those cleanup criteria for the property itself. So if Lanxis was trying to remediate just its property and there was no offsite contamination, then, then they could either use the standards that are in the ministry's cleanup guidelines. Sometimes they're the drinking water standards, sometimes they're not. Uh, or it can do a very site-specific risk assessment about uh, with, with all the considerations for what the drinking water standards are, all the exposure limits, all the different ways at which those standards were set and set site-specific cleanup criteria for that particular property, and that would be approved by the Ministry of the Environment. That applies to the property. That does not apply to the offsite contamination. So the control order is the framework that we're currently working under for dealing with the offsite contamination. The province's cleanup approach didn't exist. 30 years ago when the control order was established. It was why we are where we are. 
Otherwise, they could just flip it, I think. I'm not trying to speak for the ministry, but it would be my understanding that they could just revert to these cleanup guidelines. But no, we're offset already. There's already been an impact. There's different process from a regulatory perspective. I'm not going to comment on whether I have a complete understanding of that, but it's always been my understanding and my review and how it's been dealt with with all the risk assessments I dealt with for 30 years of the Indian water loop. And the fact that you can have very high levels of concentrations of contaminants on a property and still be acceptable cleanup to the ministry environment. But that's a very detailed and a different process. And it's not been my understanding that Lanxus wants to go that approach. It's also entirely company driven when it's done on the site. So I'm not sure like that, that having that discussion might be useful. I'm not saying one way or another. I'm just saying. I don't think the framework in the province of Ontario, unless it applies it in an offsite plume approach. So that's just my comment back on um, the the comment about looking at the the guidelines. They may be old. I don't know. I I, I always relied on the ministry to tell me or the public health groups to tell me what the cleanup guidelines were and or the standards were, and that's what I rely on. So that whole process may be entirely different. So that I just want to try to provide some context on whether that's actually going to be a reasonable approach or not. I don't think it is because I don't think that's where we are, but I don't want to handcuff anybody from looking at that future. And I know that Jason has already commented that he was going to go back. So I think that's great if you want, if, if that can be done, we can have that clarity. So my original point that I wanted to make when, when I came here is, I think those questions that now we've been highlighting several times and I perhaps inadvertently elevated them as the questions, they're not. They're, they're part of a document that's called the Pathway to Remediate Remedial Objectives for the Municipal Act which described all the technical things that Lancis was going to do, how they were going to do updates to their remediation, how they were going to turn on new wells, how they were going to measure the impacts of those. And, and then once you got to the, once you were in the framework of all the technical evaluations, these were then important, these were then important questions. And I, I want to read this paragraph. So there's six questions. Um, I don't need to go and tell you what those are, but the limits of available technology to achieve the mass removal needed to satisfy the requirements of question one and question two within a reasonable time frame and cost may not be possible for the complex municipal aquifer geological system. It is widely acknowledged to maximize remediation effort to areas that give the biggest impact. This implies a shift from the remediation everywhere paradigm to a focus on those zones that contribute to the ultimate use of the municipal aquifer, groundwater as a resource, i.e. a shift, that's, that's technical. Thus, answers to questions three and six become relevant to, to setting achievable remedial objectives and timing. These were never designed to be public questions. These were always to be viewed as part of the evaluation of the technical components of what Lancis was doing through their remediation and their updated remediation. So I, I think somehow these questions have elevated themselves to, to these are the questions that we need to solve. No, they, these aren't the questions we need to solve. They're intertwined with the remediation program that Lancis has set up. So rather than bringing these questions up every time i think what we what we need to do is is uh, as uh, i have suggested and as tiffany has, has also suggested we need to make sure that what's been done so far is up to date so we can dig into this technical framework and help answer some of these questions and and figure out where we're going to move if we're going to move from a groundwater must meet drinking water standard everywhere to a site specific or a geographically specific area. That then brings up the question that, that, that arose earlier. Yes, it may be above the drinking water standards 
may meet the drinking water standards in the treated drinking water, but is there someone who wants to use that? I don't think if I was at the region of Waterloo, I'd be saying I want to use it as a potable drinking water supply. Yeah. There may be an industry out there that would be willing to use that as part of their drinking, part of their industrial supply. And when the region had looked at this in the past, not for that reason, but for other waste products, you have to go out and find that company that is going to be willing to do that. So our options for using that treated water, not our options, the options for using the treated water could be simple, as simple as saying, that seems like we as a community generally think that that would be a good use of the water. So if Lancis wants to go out and find somebody to use that water, go at it. I don't think anybody would be upset about that. Um, but but I think, you know, trying to focus too much on these questions, those aren't the questions that we as a committee should be focusing on. They're questions we can look at as we're thinking about now what do we do? And this document that was, I'm assuming had to have been written by Lancis and GHD staff, um, uh, they set that framework out. They posed those questions. They were sort of created by us. I'll, I'll jump in here because I get Please what you're do. saying completely. Um, I, I just think we, I, I, I'm only going to say, my point was we were taking these questions completely out of context for the reason of which they were initially asked. And, and I'd say I think it's the responsibility for that. potentially highlighting these. I think for my intention is talking about a 2028 control order. Uh, and just opening it up to the floor could have been wonderful, but it also could have fallen flat. And while these questions aren't the best questions, they're the best questions that I've seen so far. Um, and I don't think that they've been answered, certainly not to my liking. So I do think that they still have value. And are they the best questions? No, I agree that they're not. But for our conversation today, I felt that they were good fodder for us to work with there, because again, I don't feel like these questions have been answered completely. I do think there are a lot of question marks that stem from these questions as well. And so what I would like to land on is, you know, some framework questions that we as a committee feel comfortable putting forward. You know, what do we want answered as a committee? What do we want to engage the public on? And I know that we're not there yet, but I think that it's important that we continue to have these conversations with those questions or with them. Um, so I can guarantee for next meeting, um, we'll do some work behind the scenes and try to foster, you know, some some better discussion questions that will kind of continue this discussion. Um, but in the interest of time, I think that this has been a pretty good conversation. Hadley, I do see your hand up, so I want to give you an opportunity. Mayor Council. Do you have your hand up too? Well, see what happens when you sit beside me. I can't see you. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Abby. No, first, I, I just want to say I appreciate all the thoughtful conversation, right? You guys are good citizens, and it's amazing to be a part of this. You know, as a as new, it's really something. And um, just a general thought. But then, what, what I'm what I'm hearing is a little bit technologies move forward. Um, regulations have moved forward and we're still kind of stuck in this framework when it was all new, you know, 30 years ago when it was a crisis, when people were trying to figure out answers to problems and solutions that they didn't know what they were yet. And maybe it's it's about talking with Waterloo and the region and understanding where do what do they see in their master plan and needing this municipal aquifer. And maybe you guys have those answers. I don't as the new person, but it, it might, the outcome of these very thoughtful questions and this thoughtful discourse might be a different control order, right? To talk about where the water needs to be for the future use, because we're it, we're spending a lot of energy and money on treating it the way we've always treated it, and then sending it to the creek, right? I I personally kind of have problems with that, just because it's clean drinking water that can't be used, right? And it, it just doesn't make sense to use all that energy to then dump it into a creek personally. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe there's a way to, to change the outcome of this 2028 target to the outcome for what matters and what's important in 2028, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. Yeah. That may that... be the conversation in a way. Yeah, Sean, sorry for neglecting you there. No, no, that's okay. It's been a good conversation. And much of what I was thinking has been articulated maybe in different ways. Um, I, I think we've got three different places that we need to ask questions and or provide information. So we've got our technical experts and we've got questions for them and they have questions that they need to, to wrestle with. And I, I, I think we need to let them do that first before we can move to the next step. Um, and we've got, we've got track, we've got this group and then we've got the public. And I, I know we need to go back to the public and we need to get input from the public, but I think more than that, we need to educate the public because there's been a whole lot of information and a whole lot happened in the last years. Most of the public doesn't have a clue and probably doesn't really care as long as they're drinking safe water. Um, so, so I guess a couple of things. I, I, I think we need more than one set of questions if we're talking about questions. But I think first, um, I like the idea of letting the technical experts get together. These questions reflect um, questions that we all have and, and will inform our direction. And so I, I, think, I think I'd like to let them wrestle with it and uh, come back and, and let us know where they stand and where they come up with, and then we can question them. But for the public, I'm not sure if it's questions or education and how that comes together yet. It's pretty, it's pretty. That kind of could naturally bridge us into item 10 on our agenda if there's no further discussion on the deadline itself. Uh, the spring update to council, I know in our last meeting, we had kind of discussed some ways in which we could uh, proceed with that. And based on my recollection, correct me if I'm wrong, it was uh, more or less a very high level update of what the committee is. We're not really trying to come forth with a whole lot of information with uh, related to the control order and all of that stuff. It's more some of the changes that have been made structurally to the committee, uh, kind of getting that conversation started. Um, I remember at our last meeting as well, there was talk about being very deliberate with what we want to bring forward, which each one of those council presentations have a bit of a strategic framework almost with how that looks. Um, with that being said, we were hoping to move forward in this this spring with a, an update to council. Um, I, I don't know that we need to rush it. I don't want to, you know, appear in front of council without, you know, information that's relevant and uh, polished, I think is what I'm really looking for. So, Again, I wanted to open this up for discussion. Is the committee comfortable with doing um, our next, well, I guess our, our first update to council later in the summer? I think when I was talking to Councillor Schwent, we were thinking maybe August um, could be a good time frame just because I don't think that we have a lot of meetings in July uh, as it sits now, and we wouldn't want to leave it too long um, past September because we meet again in September. So I know that I'm just kind of uh, droning on here. So I'll open it up to the floor to see if there's any uh, thoughts or considerations on this one. Yeah, council on the 27th. Of July? Of August. It was right there to your right. That gives us quite a substantial runway. Um, more than two months. Um, so I would have no problem working with you, Tiffany, uh, to prepare that. Um, if the committee is comfortable with that direction, you know, just kind of a high level, some of the changes we've made from TAGRAC to now, we've met a couple of times, high level discussion on direction we're taking things. Yeah. 
Um, just to point out, I mean, tonight I think is an illustration. There is disagreement uh, as to the direction there. So uh, if you're going to present to council, I think it, it's imperative that you also recognize that there's no uniformity or consensus here. Um, I have just I have disagreements with with the points that were raised by Eric, and we can have a long lengthy discussion about that. And it's, it would be I think pretty deep. So if you are going to present to council, I think you need to be aware that there is no consensus here. All right. So what 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 would be said would have to be given certain caveats or cautions um, about that. So I think there's there's a there's this fundamental disagreements here going on. I appreciate that, and I think that it's important that we have those disagreements in a lot of respects, right? Uh, some of the conflict that may be generated with these discussions is inevitably meant to lead to growth and development, not just you know for us personally, but for the community and how we can remediate the aquifer. So I appreciate the comment. It's a valid point. Thank you for that. Um, any other thoughts? or considerations that you would like to send back uh, with Tiffany or I um, as we prepare to bring this forward then? Linda? Just, and, and, and I appreciate that, that uh, Sebastian's comments and, 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 and I was thinking the same thing, that that's, that's where we're gonna get, that's what we're here for is to, we're not all gonna agree on everything and, and do that, but, and you're in keeping it high level is a good thing. I was just wondering in the time frame is it is it possible that a draft could be circulated to the committee, and then the committee has the opportunity to review it. And if there is any major concerns with the content, then that could be hashed out before the final report went. A hundred percent, because we have such a, a runway here, I wouldn't see any problem with that. So, um, Tiffany, do you foresee any issues working together? We should be able to pass some sort of a draft in the next month or so. Yeah, no, I I think uh, I think a high level. Um, high level in and of itself will sort of, I think, illustrate that, I mean, we're not speaking about consensus specifically on specific subject matter, but just more sort of here are the big questions that need to get answered. Here is some general direction that we're taking and moving moving the issues forward. So I, I don't see the timeline being an issue and I don't see the the framework that we're gonna be working within being an issue. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I guess the final question, is there any questions that the committee would like to ask of council during um, the presentation? And I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. My assumption is that you probably wouldn't, but um, you never know. So if there is something, even if it doesn't come to you off the top of your head right now, um, send me an email and I'll be sure that uh, we get any of those questions answered at the council table. Um, that brings us to other business. So we have a number of things. No, we don't. We have one item in other business, uh, the 2023 Annual Environmental Report. And David, I think that you're going to speak to this. Yeah. Um, so for the, the, the people who are new to, to what if we got a track. Um, this is the annual environmental report. It is different than the annual monitoring report. The annual monitoring report specifically deals with soil, sediment, and all the historical stuff that's happened. The annual environmental report is basically everything else environmental that the ministry has control over. Um, so it starts with discussing um, air emissions. So basically all good news mostly across the board. Um, they decreased air emissions, I think, 16%. Um, it represents, I think, a 14% reduction based on production kind of thing. So even though it's a 6% reduction, that was a 2% reduction decrease. So that kind of factors out. Um, toluene dropped by over half from the, and this is all 2023 versus 2021. Um, sorry, 2023 versus 2022, the previous year. Um, toluene was cut in half, mostly due to production decreases in toluene containing products. They they stopped using it. Um, there's a whole bunch of criteria air contaminants. Um, they're basically all the contaminants that used to give us smog days and acid rain and all the stuff that my kids have no idea what they mean, um, thankfully. Um, so they're carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, nitrous oxide, oxides of nitrogen, total particulate matter, particulate matter less than 10 microns, particulate matter less than 2.5 microns, sulfur dioxide, and VOCs. Um, so these decrease by a factor of 25%. 
Um, again, it's due mainly due to production decreases that they decreased. Um, the moral of the story for air is everything's good. Everything's within the point of impingement releases. Every, there's a few contaminants over 10% of the point of impingement. Um, the ministry cares when it gets to 90, um, but they just flag these ones that are over 10. Um, that basically means 2023, not much change. 2022, but nothing changed in the computer model either. Um, the last change, I think, was the last big one was the suburban uh, meteorological data they had to use. Um, odor modeling, they've had no complaints, and the odor modeling says they shouldn't have any complaints. So um, that's it for their mission side. For environmental health and safety, they continue under the new responsible care program, uh, which is the American Chemistry Council's RC 14001-2015. Um, they still do comply with the CIAC version of responsible care, but it's toned down because so much of responsible care is in 14,000 ISO 14,000. Um, so that's mostly just a, a, an audit and review of all their environmental health, safety, security type of uh, systems. Uh, for noise, uh, they had no noise complaints. Uh, stage three of the system uh, ended on 1st of October. They finished that early. There is no timeline given for stage four um, of the noise abatement plan. Um, when stage four is done, they're basically going to be compliant with noise emissions in Ontario. Um, but th there was no timeline in the actual uh, monitoring report, sorry, environmental report. Uh, soil and sediments, it, that line is exactly what it says in the report, is, although I have the typo is in there. Uh, but basically, it's covered under the AMR, which was submitted two days before this report. Uh, NDMA was not detected in their discharge. That's their actual treatment system discharge um, in 2023. Uh, all of their waste sumps were inspected. Um, the ministry did perform an inspection on the 8th of October. This would be the district ministry environmental officer. Um, there were no actionable items based on their site visit. And the only recommendation to come out of the report is, and it's given every single time, um, is that GHB recommends they come with a waste drum labeling system to ensure no drums are stored for more than 90 days, which would be a violation of uh, ministry requirements. It's been the recommendation for as long as I think I've been here. Um, they've never done it, which also tells me that they've never had a problem, so that's why they don't do it. Um, but that recommendation repeats itself in this, in this modern environmental report. Sorry. And that's the summary. Great. Thanks, David. Any questions or comments on the summary or the environmental report in general? Just out of curiosity, I don't know if anybody has this, but where do the waste drums go? I mean, do they go to an incinerator down uh, someplace? It would vary based on what it is. Okay. Like so a waste you, disposal company would take it, like waste management. Or, and then they, they do they deposit it into a, a pit or do they actually refine it in some way? And what's handling yeah. it? So I'll answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know. So I, I don't know. I could ask somebody from the plant to provide information. There's a Jamie should be able to, I don't know, I think Jamie yeah. that, but it's just cur curiosity. I mean, the question, the core of the question here, Hadley, is do they just ship it to another location and bury it someplace else rather than what they did? It would, it would be sites? following the regulations, right? So, whatever, based on the type, if it's hazardous, non hazardous, it would go to the correct disposal facility type. But okay. I, I don't know enough about their waste generation at the plant. Okay. I guess the follow up to that question is if it is a regular recommendation coming forth, is there any intention from Lancis to follow through with that? And this is off the cuff again. I, I feel like it was the answer was adequate, right? They haven't had a problem. We're not getting violations. If um you, the plant is heavily manage with and regulated and and then going over and above following the ISO and the responsible care. So if it hasn't been a problem, why fix it? If it becomes a problem for sure, it would show they needed a better system. But you know, ISO is all about systems. So I, I just get the feeling that it's working for them. Well and I wonder too, because I did the responsible care many, many years ago I was on site. Um, it it's probably something that is electronic. Because the actual recommendation in GH report always says a label on the drum so that someone can see, oh, that has been here too long, that hasn't. Um, so my best guess would be there is a barcode system in place that sees that. But you, you there, there's no clarity to an observer. I don't know how long that drum has been here. Any other comments, folks? No? 
All right, we have four pieces of correspondence. They've been added to the package. Are there any comments, questions, concerns with those items of correspondence? <clears throat> that brings us to our next meeting date, which has been scheduled um, for September 19th. And thanks to Stacy for pre-scheduling many of the meetings so that we actually have a date and don't have to spend time finagling calendars. Um, so hopefully that date works for everybody. If not, send me an email. No? No good? Do we have more than uh, more than a few people that know that that date would be any good? No good for you, Sebastian? No, it's pretty good. All right. Well, we may have to look at exploring another date if that's the case. The week, um, week before, possibly, yeah. Okay, Thursday before. If anybody does have concerns with the date, could you send Stacy just an email uh, and let her know? And if we know for a fact that we won't be reaching quorum, we'll definitely reschedule. But if we can move forward with it with just a couple of people missing, then we may have to do that as well. I'll send Stacy a, a note, but I'm in the same boat as, as Sebastian. The week before would work, but not that particular Thursday. But I'll send uh, uh, I'll send an email. And we can send a, an updated invite out if that is the case, if we end up changing it then. Um, do we know off the top of the head if the week before would work for most people's schedules? That would be September 12th. I think so. Yeah. So perhaps we tentatively schedule it then for September the 12th. September 12th would work. What? Yeah. Okay. So it's looking good so far, Stacey. Um, all right. We'll work at making that change. Um, so you'll be getting an updated calendar in the next little while. Um, that brings us to adjournment. Um, do we need a mover and a seconder for adjournment, or do we just take off? Can I get a mover? Thanks, Sebastian. Seconder. You just want to stay, right? Uh, all in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Um, before we do go, I know that the card has been circulating. Uh, we do have a retirement card for Ramin. So if you do get a chance to sign it, uh, we'll get that sent away to him. Um, just to, to thank him for all of his time and effort here. Um, for those of you online, if you don't have a chance, um, we can either send me an email if you want your uh, message to be included in the card. Um, or we can try and work out a time to meet and uh, I can have you sign the card in person as well. Um, so just like, you know. All right, thanks everybody for the, the meeting. Thanks for the discussion. Uh, and I'll see you all in a few months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.